All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to today's webinar uh, with Baylor Law School and the uh, LLM in Litigation Management Program. I want to introduce you to our guests. And I'm hosting. My name is V. I am with the enrollment uh, team at Baylor. And I want to introduce Professor Jim Wren and Professor Liz Fraley. Hi, good morning or afternoon, everybody, depending on your time zone. <laughs> so these two are the you know, phenomenal leadership team that have created this program. And we've had a year of you know, uh, candidates in the first inaugural class now. So we're super excited to come back and talk about their experience. So I'm going to take us through the agenda for about a half hour. We're going to talk and have a conversation about this program. And then for 15 minutes or so, we're going to have a Q&A session. And so you'll see that, um, you know, now that we have, you know, a year ago, we had the concept, the curriculum built out, but we didn't have people. So today, we're really going to talk about the people, the candidates, the brain trust, and answer the critical questions that uh, perspectives, uh, you know, applicants are asking all of us, are asking me every day. So as I, you know, I'm introducing this program to everybody, uh, I, I really want to take this, you know, kind of webinar to answer a lot of those questions and to get the insights from Jim and Liz about this program from the inside out, from the inside of the classroom with the inaugural class. So uh, with that said, I am going to go and to the next slide and really talk a little bit about, um, you know, the inaugural class. So you'll see that the average years of experience has been phenomenal. We've had uh, 21 candidates with over 15 years of practice experience as they uh, are participating in this program from different 15 different states, six from, six from Texas, four California, uh, two in Florida, two from Pennsylvania, uh, nine females, 12 males, a third of whom are in-house counsel attorneys, one, the other third outside in plaintiff's counsel, and one third are uh, consultants, they bring a governmental perspective. And we even have a law school dean in our class. Uh, some companies that they're from, Whole Foods, Amazon, Walmart, Merrick Bank, Travelers and Shelter Insurance Companies. Even uh, from the governmental, we have a state of Tennessee uh, candidate and uh, Ray Reed and McGraw LLP and many more uh, companies and law firms and consultancy. So we have a super diverse class. Of, uh, of our inaugural class candidates. So I'm going to you know, hand it over to Liz and Jim to talk about kind of how it's been going and maybe talk a little bit more about this inaugural class and highlight how they, what's been the experience for them. Thank you, V. Um, we were really excited by this inaugural class. You know, we, we cast a net into the pond and didn't really know what we would scoop in. And we felt like we really hit the mother load because we have got a group of candidates who are diverse in every way that we could hope. They come from different backgrounds. They bring different insights and experiences. And we really were so pleasantly surprised at this diverse group. And I think that has played out really well in how they interact, not only with the professors and brain trust members, but with each other. Because, you know, I, I remember last year at this time when we were talking about this, we talked about how we hoped that we would come at issues from different angles. And that has very much come to fruition because the inside counsel are talking about it differently from the plaintiff's attorney. Um, candidly, and thank you, Mary, for being part of our inaugural class, I didn't think we'd have someone from the state of Tennessee involved. And that's been a whole new layer. So from my perspective, I just couldn't be more excited about the diverse group of interesting and interested candidates that we've had this first time. Yeah, I think the diversity has not only been in terms of the uh, perspectives, that is inside counsel, outside counsel, plaintiff counsel, insurance counsel, et cetera, but also in the diverse uh, range of experience, uh, all the way from two to three years experience up to 30 plus years experience and everything in between. And that has also, I think, brought a lot of diverse perspectives into this that have been very valuable. So we're really hoping that that will continue to expand. And I think we have 
um, uh, responded to that by targeting interests for the different candidates, things that we didn't know we were going to want or need, but that's expanded our brain trust, that's expanded the programming for the residential session. And so it's been nice to have a vibrant living program that's been able to evolve and grow to meet our candidates' needs. Um, and one nice thing about having a group of 20 or so candidates, we can be very nimble and responsive to what they are really interested in learning while keeping it in the bigger framework of the core needs for somebody who's going to have special expertise in litigation management. Great, great. Well, thank you. So the, the, many of the, the, the prospective candidates for the second class have been asking, wow, so who are they? So we'd learn a little bit about who they are, they are and their background. So even I'm super curious. What kind of conversations are they having inside the walls, right? We have counsel from Walmart. We have counsel from Amazon. We have insurance companies, banks, you know, inside, outside counsel. So yeah, do you have some stories that you love to share, insights and perspectives, the unique perspective that's kind of, you know, kind of bringing together insights and learning for, for everybody? Well, there are many. Um, it was very fun during the residential session to have them all together. You know, distance learning is really convenient if you're a busy practicing attorney, no matter the, the venue in which you practice, but you give up that being in the classroom together all the time. And so the first thing that I think was so neat for these candidates was that when they got on campus, those people you'd been in sessions with, maybe posting on message boards, exchanging perspective, they were all here in Waco. I was helpfully in a trial for part of it, and I'd get these hilarious pictures at night after my trial of the whole group of candidates out maybe having dinner or whatever, and they'd be snapping pictures, texting them to me, saying, wish you were here. And that was, to me, a great piece of the program to see them bonding and enjoying each other's company. Um, I think from a collegial perspective, there has ramped up through the first two trimesters the amount of time that they serve as resources for each other. It is really common that we hear two or three candidates who got together and we're talking about a given situation or who have proven to be resources for each other within their work. And that's been our experience as well. I had a very cool experience with Aaron Mutnick, um, one of our candidates, where the topic of one of my first trimester classes, proving and attacking damages, was something that he got to put to use in an incredibly complex piece of litigation he was handling. And it was really validating for me, and I hope for him, that we could work through what we had talked about in class, the processes, apply it, and really have a great one-on-one, -on -one, real world, real life situation. Um, and he got the case resolved, which was good for him and good for his company. So that was a, a very neat hands-on experience for me. There's a lot of communication that goes back and forth uh, on a uh, at least weekly sort of basis and really much more than that. The candidates are talking to us every week. We're having synchronous sessions. Uh, we're also having uh, feedback conversations. We, in fact, we had just one of those this morning. We have one every Tuesday morning. So we're getting lots of feedback on a very uh, regular basis, but they're also talking to each other. Uh, Liz was talking about the effect of that, but they have Slack channels, uh, some of which we are part of, others which we are very intentionally not part of because we want them having the opportunity to talk completely unfettered uh, back and forth about what they are learning, where they are having any struggles, what the uh, how they can help each other. And that has been, and we know this from talking to them, that has been a very, I think, impactful part of this program, that networking and bonding that is going on. And from, again, those diverse perspectives, who would have thought, inside counsel, outside counsel, plaintiff counsel, insurance counsel, et cetera, are actually trying to work together to learn this material, even though they're at times on different sides of the docket. Great, great. Um, so you know, as we're talking about the experiences, the commitment is very real, right? Uh, let's talk a little bit maybe about the structure, the time it takes. 
I mean, we, we started this uh, program a year ago and we felt like this is the right amount of work. Well, what's been the feedback and, you know, the, talk a little bit about the flexibility and the adjustments that have been made and how have, how, how's that enabling the learning from these busy professionals, attorneys, you know, juggling multiple, uh, you know, kind of workload and, and uh, just so busy that, you know, how are they able to balance and how is the program adapting to that? I get that need for balancing. Can we jump in there? Yep. Yeah, one of the, the very first thing that we told this group of candidates, we brought them in for orientation before we even started the coursework. And we told them, you are the beta testers. You are on the front lines of this. We want to hear from you because we know anytime you're uh, stepping into a major project, and this is a major project, that not just you, we have much to learn. We want your feedback. They haven't disappointed. They have given us <laughs> lots of feedback. And oftentimes it has resulted in us uh, making recalibrations. Uh, we didn't know exactly what those would be. We just knew we would be making them and we have been making those sort of adjustments. And you're asking about time. The Our expectation going in is that the time involved would be somewhere uh, less than 15 hours a week, more probably closer to that 10 hour per week. And in truth, we found out very quickly that it was taking them more time than that. And we had to we had to calib recalibrate that. But we found what we believe is the sweet spot, which is somewhere in that 15 hour per week range. At times it was taking them more than that, even at, uh, in some matters, significantly more than that. Well, we had to ramp that back because that's an adjustment we have to make. But you only find that out by working through the material, working through the program for the first time. So really to go to your real question, what's the time involvement? We're telling people now it's in that 15 uh, or slightly plus, uh, certainly less than 20, but in that 15 plus hour per week range, not throughout the year, but through these 13 weeks that we have two of those per year. Those During those 13 week time periods leading up to our intensive week on campus, you can figure on budgeting about 15 to slightly possibly more than that, 15, 16, 17 hours per week. And a lot of that depends on uh, comfort with reading speed, et cetera. Um, and that's a major commitment, but we've also learned how to adjust and calibrate for that. Well, some of this too, if you're considering the program, you know, you've got to think about your learning patterns. And there were a couple of things that came into play. The great thing about 15 years average experience, that means most of our candidates hadn't been in school for a really, really long time. And when you are in the swing of having been in law school, you're just used to that academic reading and pattern of studying. And so it is somewhat different when you're fitting it in to a professional setting. Now, I will say the bulk of the reading materials, in my view, are more like what you would be reading in practice anyway. Yes. We are not assigning very textbooks, law review articles. That is not where we're going. These are very practice oriented, cutting edge readings. But let's face it, some of the e-discovery matters, some of the data analytics and cybersecurity, GDPR, that's some dense going. And so the other thing we figured out is all reading pages are not created equally. And so you've got to have some ebb and flow with that. But back to my point, think about who you are. We had candidates watching video sessions like this and stopping every minute or two to be taking notes. Well, that is a really slow way to watch a video. Yes. So our hack for that was let us give you transcripts. Don't spend your time making notes. We'll give you the transcripts. It's a little humbling being on this side of the camera and seeing your words and transcripts, but still happy to do that. And so that has helped us evolve into a more manageable piece. But we don't want you thinking this is easy. You know, this is a cutting edge, one of a kind program teaching you skills that are not being gathered anywhere else all in one place. So it is going to be demanding. And as one of our candidates put it really well, I wouldn't expect anything less from a one of a kind program sponsored by Baylor Law. And I thought that was some good old truth and advertising there. <laughs> but I think everybody has settled more into 
how can I do it? How does it meet my scheduling needs? The other thing that we've done is we've gotten a lot more flexible about the timing of courses. We do have so many busy, active trial lawyers, whether they're trying the case or they're uh, waiting for a verdict because they're in-house counsel. And so we have built in a lot more flexibility that lets the candidates do work in chunks that goes with their work schedule. Yeah, V, as you well know, we have uh, moved to a self-paced uh, type of schedule because we recognize that for these kinds of busy professionals, not every week is created the same. Some weeks, if they're particularly if they are in trial or a heavy discovery schedule or other type of matters are coming up, they don't need to be required to turn in the same amount of work or even any work during that week if it can be done in a future week. So what we've done is to move to very quickly to a self-paced sort of program where the candidates are figuring out, okay, here's the work that needs to be done. And it's a matter of calendaring it over that 13 week time period leading up to the residential session. As long as the work is getting done, we're great with it. And uh, we have learned very quickly, these are trusted professionals that, uh, they are great to work with. They get the work done. Yeah. And we've built in catch up weeks. Yeah. You know, that that 13 weeks doesn't comprise 13 different modules for every class. We have intentionally built in catch up times where if you've gotten behind, there's a dedicated week where there's not new material coming out. We've hit pause to let you absorb. And particularly for the classes where the concepts build, we just think that's crucial so that the candidates really build in that good understanding, really immerse in it. Um, you know, this is not a class where you're supposed to just whiz through the videos. We really want them absorbing it. And I think it's helped. No question. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. I, I think, um, you know, many prospective candidates, they're, they're thinking about the program seriously and they love the direction. They love the promise of the ROI. So let, let's dig into that a little bit here. Uh, I know we're halfway through just about midway through the inaugural class. What, what would you say are, are the biggest ROIs that you're seeing from uh, different candidates or different individuals as they go through this program? I can tell you what they are saying, what they are reporting back. And it, I think one word that we have heard several different times in different ways is indispensable. They are in, I heard this coming out as a young lawyer, yeah. the way to build a practice is to make yourself indispensable to your firm, to make yourself indispensable to your clients. You are the go-to person. And the sense is this is absolutely doing this in terms of figuring out how to manage litigation like a business, both professionally and financially. And it's, it's making them uh, creating for them that sense of being indispensable to their organization. Uh, the other real, I think, uh, aspect that I'm hearing is a sense of the field slowing down, seeing the field. Uh, to use a sports analogy, like the quarterback who is seeing the field and the game is slowing down, they, depending on the perspective of the various candidates, they are uh, bringing already a lot of knowledge to the table. But by being able to put it into a framework to see all of this comprehensively as an overarching scheme uh, where the parts fit together, they're starting to see how all of this works together. And it's also helping them identify the blind spots that they not even heard of or heard of, but had no idea, no concept of where it fit in. It is pulling all of that together and it's allowing them to see the field. And once you see the field differently, you, you don't unsee it. It's like knowing where Waldo is and that where's Waldo picture. Once, <laughs> once they yeah. see it differently, then they see the whole process differently. I mean, one of our candidates who's in-house counsel said, you know, my company should be sending everyone in my department to do this because it's just a revolutionary way of looking at things. I, you know, Jim and I both still have some law practice that we do, and I'm finding that in my own practice. Even as I'm teaching this, I see handling it differently. I assess cases differently 
earlier. I look a lot more at the economics of the litigation and how can I use these processes to drive to a better, more efficient result for the client. And we really are hearing this from the candidates, uh, but I'm also hearing from them a sense that they understand these seeds are being planted and that they're going to bear more fruit even down the road. There's that that first sense of, oh, yeah, this early harvest. But, but these are perennial concepts. They're going to come back and continue to grow and develop and mature. And to Jim's point, I think the more they do, the more these are differentiators. And to be able to come in and talk intelligently about this field of litigation management and what it could mean, boy, wouldn't that be a game changer in a job interview when you're trying to go from outside counsel in-house, you're trying to move up, you see it differently. And boy, that's something that I think our candidates are really feeling. And one, to add one more point to that in terms of return, one of the things that, is, that we are emphasizing in the program are is taking these concepts and customizing them for the specific type of litigation practice each of our candidates are involved in. So oftentimes our assignments are, are taking these and figuring out, okay, how do I modify this approach to fit my specific practice area? Great, great. I think this is a good segue into the faculty brain trust. We've been talking mainly about the candidates and their experience. The, I, I think the other impressive um, you know, roster that I share with every prospective candidate are, are the faculty brain trust. So I'm going to toggle in. I would love for you two to kind of maybe talk about the connections, the interactions, and some examples of how you know, the, 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 the inaugural class, how they're learning, how they're getting insights from the faculty brain trust group. Well, I, I hearken back to the first residential session. And, you know, the candidates had just been through a, a pretty rigorous course on data analytics put together by part of our brain trust who come from the business school. So they are really learning from a business perspective, data analytics. And then Steven Geisler, one of our brain trust members who's at Huawei and heading their IP litigation came in and showed the candidates what he can do in just a few minutes with data analytics. And I truly think I heard jaws dropping all over the room because in just a few minutes with a few slides, they had this really transformative experience of what all that math and science suddenly could mean for their company. And I think that has been the experience as they're interacting with the brain trust members. Um, I've certainly heard of them going offline and having separate conversations, trying to learn more about a given field. And we're expanding the brain trust more and more. We've got just an astonishing group coming in the second residential session and people who are really highly placed corporate counsel as well uh, to fill out and enhance that perspective. Yeah, you're seeing it across the board. Uh, I'm looking right there at your screen there at the uh, bottom left of the screen is Violet Sullivan, yeah. who uh, got rave reviews from our candidates because she, she is an attorney who lives and breathes cybersecurity and brings all of the very day-to-day -day practical issues that arise in litigation context with cybersecurity. I mean, face it, uh, when we are dealing with e-discovery, and right above her is Chris Schultz, who uh, is one of those who lives and breathes e-discovery. Cybersecurity and e-discovery are joined at the hip. And to have those kind of brain trust members who can come in and bring their very specialized perspectives to bear uh, brings us alive. It, ma it makes it very, very real for the folks that are having to deal with this every day, our candidates. Well, and let me toggle to the other end of the row, opposite Violet. Laura Fay is a brain trust member who one of our candidates introduced us to. And Laura is one of those brilliant people who makes you wake up in the night at three o'clock in the morning because she starts to point out all the things about privacy that we should know but don't. 
we didn't even appreciate when we were initially putting the brain trust together that we would need a privacy specialist, but we've got Laura and she will be here during the second residential session to do some bonus work for candidates. Even though privacy isn't part of the second trimester curriculum, we felt like her expertise was so timely and needed. We're just bringing her in for bonus sessions. And, and that's the kind of people our brain trust tend to be people who are very generous with their time and incredibly passionate about their field of expertise. And it is just a dynamic combination. It also proves that we're learning right along with our clients. <laughs> yes, we are. This gray hair, that's for you, Laura Faye. <laughs> so I, I'm just scrolling through you know, our, our extensive list of faculty brain trust mm -hmm. members. Feel free to call out any experiences or- Ooh, Holly Hernandez is going to be here the second trimester. She has got a fascinating background. She's not a traditional in-house counsel for one company. Um, I'm not going to spread it too much, but she and Keith Calcote, who were on the previous page, both have very interesting in-house counsel positions, and they're going to be there actually to workshop problems with the candidates so that they'll be group solving problems, and then they'll have to run it past this panel of in-house counsel to help them see what did you miss? What did you think about this? Here's how if you were presenting it to me. Um, so it's not just panels with people talking at you. It's problem solving with your brain trust experts right there. We think that's where the really in-depth practical learning takes place. Great. I, I think um, let's talk a little bit about this summer research project and how that connects a candidate with a faculty brain trust member to work on something to get it published. So let's, let's I want to hear from you, you all, or the two of you, how does that work and have people already sort of thinking about topics and uh, let's, let's focus in on that a little bit. Well, first of all, one of our very clear stated objectives of this program is to not only provide a direct return on investment within an individual organization or firm, but we want to create thought leaders, national thought leaders. And a key part of that is actually putting these candidates out there in publishing situations where they are tackling some specific aspect, uh, typically an, uh, a topic that is already directly related to the need of their firm, their organization, but that uh, deserves a deeper dive. And so what we are doing as part of this program is providing the resources. We actually provide research help. We uh, provide our uh, senior JD students as just additional research uh, a resource for that. We provide the faculty guidance on this, and then we connect our candidates with either brain trust members, or we will go help them find a, a person with that particular expertise somewhere in the nation. Uh, whether we know them initially or not, we'll help make the outreach to them so that they have the resources to put together that research project, that paper, um, and we give them the essentially the time to do that, and uh, particularly in the summertime to do that, because it comes back to being a national thought leader. We're excited that we're looking to publish a special edition of the Baylor Law Review that will be dedicated to litigation management topics. So we're, we're trying to walk the walk too. The other thing that I think is really crucial about the research assignment is that the candidates choose the topic. We're not handing out research for them to do. We want this to be a passion project for them. And so there's tremendous leeway for the candidates to choose a topic, a field, an area, and really think about it. You know, going back to you haven't been a law student for a long time, but that means sometimes you haven't had the luxury of really thinking deeply over a long period of time about the way things could be. And that's what a lot of these projects are. How could the things be? How could we affect the system? How can we make the management of litigation 
more effective, more efficient. And it is really exciting to see the topics that they are working on. And I'm sure they're going to have a great time this summer as they're thinking deep thoughts and writing their articles. <laughs> so believe it or not, time flies. Uh, we're just about 30 minutes in. we got about 15 minutes left. So I do want to ask one more uh, question about kind of some of the challenges. What's been the toughest challenge and how 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 you've kind of overcome those to improve the program? Let's talk about that before we move to the uh, Q&A session officially. My first thought on that, and I've already alluded to this, is the recognition that our candidates are busy people. These are already people that are successful in their own right, which means they're working uh, out there and they have demands on their time. So we have had to figure out how can we accommodate that, still get to them what needs to be in the program, which has led us to uh, make the recalibrations that I've talked about, to uh, make this self-paced, but still give them a way to judge where they are and to be sure that they can get the work done on some sort of calendar basis. I would say that it has been the number one uh, adjustment that we needed to come to uh, deal with. What would be your thoughts? Yeah, no plan of attack survives first contact with the enemy. That's exactly right. You know, we we have laughed that uh, for two people who probably have sixty or seventy years of experience with trying cases to juries and always preaching to our students, don't assume people know things. We fell into that very trap. You know what I talked about. Once you learn this, you can't unsee it. I think we needed to contextualize it more. And fortunately, I think that has been easier to do, but we skipped that step. There have been times where the candidates have said, I don't know why I need to study this. Now, that has translated to some very cool aha moments. Yeah. Uh, we had a candidate who just could not understand why we even had a course on forum selection. Why did this matter? Why was it important? It was just wasting her time until we're in the middle of a residential session. And I said, so where would you file this? This is why I needed forum. And it was one of those, yes, it was. Now, perhaps I could have contextualized it more for her up front and said, here's why you're studying these things in the first trimester. Here's the foundation we think. But collectively, she and I got there and she now has a healthy appreciation for forum selection, even though it's not a, a mainstay of her job. So I do think that remembering to contextualize things is another piece that, that is gonna make the program better as we go forward. We, we are learning creatures, we, yes. we can be taught. Great, great, thank you. Um, so one more question before we move, move to the kind of the public Q&A is, what's next for the program? I mean, I, I know it's probably a little early, but we're halfway through the first, we're growing for the second. Uh, any thoughts about one, two, or three years from now, wh what the future of this program? Because the demand, the interest has been spectacularly high, right? So it's a rising trajectory for this program. So what's next, Jim and Liz? Well, I think one thing that we are quickly moving to is to take the program and start offering every course during every, um, ev during every trimester. We're not there yet. We're probably a year or at most two years away from that. But the one of the beliefs we have is if we are able to offer every course during every trimester, that allows the maximum flexibility for our candidates coming through. And we'll probably need in order to do that, we'll probably be admitting more than one cohort per year. I anticipate we'll probably go, be going to two cohorts per year. But uh, everything requires steady steps in that direction. We don't uh, just, we want to be sure that we are building it the right way. And so we're taking that um, with the expectation of being a year or so out. And to that end, we, we just spent a couple hours this morning looking at the curriculum and really evaluating what pieces should be paired 
so that you get a better learning experience. And, and you, know, you can't really know that until you've gone through the course once, but now there are some things where, boy, it makes sense to put these two courses together. Great example, e-discovery and cybersecurity. In this initial cohort, they were in different trimesters, but the, the topics overlap so much that I think it really cuts down on redundant learning uh, but enhances how much you're going to get out of both courses. So we've been looking at how to chunk the curriculum, which when we go to multiple cohorts, I think will make it easier for the candidates to choose. OK, I should be taking these two classes at the same time. So if I'm only going to take seven hours, these should be the seven I take. We're being more intentional about what is fundamental knowledge versus what is advanced knowledge. Um, because we really think there are courses that give you needed groundwork going in. And then we spend so much time looking at how do we diversify our pool, our candidates, our brain trust, our faculty. And I don't mean just generally how we think of diversity in terms of gender or race, but background, approach, who's doing what, how are people who are thought leaders in the field approaching these issues because boy, the more we can keep this different perspectives looking at it, I think the richer the experience is going to be. So and, we're tweaking. Yeah. And B, to put all that into perspective, these sort of adjustments that Liz is just talking about right here, where we are matching the courses that need to go together, putting them together. That's something we're doing right now for this second year, second court. And we want to have that in place uh, fully laid out then before we start offering every course in every trimester, which is probably a year three up endeavor. Great, great. Thank you for that. Uh, I think it's a great time to move uh, to answer a couple of questions that have been submitted by our audience. Uh, the first is, uh, what are the current participants saying about the program? And have they, how have they been able to apply what they've learned to their job? I know we addressed some of this earlier, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you dig into more details. Okay, I am quoting. This program is hands down exactly what I think I need to take me to the next level. I enjoy my job in corporate America and hope to be an officer in our company one day. And the advent of the practice of law has changed so much in the last 16 or 17 years since I've been practicing. Litigation management, I think, is imperative for big companies. Um, you know, this is a candidate who has said over and over again, this is exactly what I need. It's the missing skill set. Um, I, I love this one, too, from one of our candidates. The law doesn't live in books. It lives in conversation and it lives in arguing. I love the law. And so coming here and doing this program has brought back a love for me, uh, which is sort of a nice little love note to our LLM program. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, we've gotten comments about the brain trust and how for what Tony credentials these people have, how incredibly generous they are with their time and expertise. I mean, they, they are here out of that same, I think, love for the law and belief that we can make the system better. Um, they're, they're sure not doing it for the money. And so it is really fabulous, I think, for our candidates to see how generous they are with their time. Absolutely. And it's very, you know, I, I'm excited to talk to prospective candidates every day because you could tell that this program is created with passion, innovation, a sense of love for the law. I mean, this is a, a great conversation to be having. Yeah, so, the, I would add one more thing to that. That passion you're talking about comes through from our candidates as a class. Uh, even as in the very beginning, as they were talking about, holy cow, this is taking more time than I anticipated. They were simultaneously saying, but this is great stuff. We've got to figure out how to get the time right, which is what we have focused on. But the, the passion that they have had for this program has been phenomenal. And Absolutely. I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. Absolutely. And we just got somebody um, who, uh, Aaron uh, asked this question, Hello, I am the current national director of legal ops for a large company, but I am not an attorney. Are there plans to retool this program into a master's or executive master's degree uh, 
you know, for legal and IT professionals that have demonstrated demonstrated experience in this field that often com uh, compete with attorneys for these high level positions. Thank you. What that, a great question. Yeah, that is yeah. a great question. We've actually spent some time talking about that. You're seeing the rise of uh, legal ops uh, organizations like Clock, where there are non-attorneys that are stepping into some extremely vital roles. And yes, we have talked about that as being a possibility of where a branch of this program might ought to go in the future. But at this point, we're back to that one step at a time sort of thing. Our focus is, since it is on specifically litigation, it is on the attorneys that are managing litigation first right now. Would that be something else that we would look at down the road? Yeah, I think there's a very good chance of that, but one step at a time. And even without a full master's program, we have talked about whether some of these modules might lend themselves to a certificate type program. Um, and that would be something that might be a nice baby step before we go to full on masters, because you're right, the, the field is evolving and it's not just folks who are licensed attorneys who are handling this. I think too, with our approach towards trying to get different perspectives, that might be a natural um, outflow of what we're doing to get non-lawyer professionals talking about the processes. Yeah, we want to go where this specialized field is naturally taking people. And if you have thoughts, email us. We would love to hear specifically from your perspective. Yes. Yeah, and, and folks who are listening in, um, Jim and Liz, they are serious about that. They are accessible, available. They will make time and time again out of the busy schedules to have informational sessions, to make connections, to speak with you about your interests and just you know, have a great conversation about litigation management, honestly. And I've, I really enjoy facilitating those. And so I do want to kind of encourage everybody to reach out, ask questions. Um, we're very open here. And this program is growing in a phenomenal way. And so we would love to engage you and kind of, you know, answer any and all questions you can you have for us about this program. So we've got about three minutes left. So Jim, Liz, any other you know, highlights or, or comments uh, we've, I think, addressed all the FAQs that I've have uh, for, for this session. So with the last few minutes, I'd love to kind of pick your brain and any kind of uh, final thoughts on, uh, you know, kind of this, this second class that we're looking to build. You know, I would love to see us be even more diverse. I think there are so many interesting ways that these tools are getting used and the conversation becomes really powerful when you've got different perspectives. You know, one thing that I think our candidates have done beautifully, and this is particularly important in these times where civil disagreement is perhaps an undervalued skill, despite the very different backgrounds and perspectives, they are incredibly respectful of each other, of their ideas, and that has created an environment where you can respectfully agree to disagree. You can have different viewpoints. You know, a number of the assignments are giving input on each other's work, ideas. Um, one of the things that they're in the process of doing right now is commenting on each other's sort of research paper outlines. And to do that in a way that is constructive and supportive, I think really facilitates a growth mindset, which is what we're looking for in candidates here. How big can you dream? How much can you grow? That's what we're trying to do here. Yeah, and it's neat seeing the back and forth between yeah. them and the sharing of resources. Great, great. Well, I'm gonna bring up one last slide here to kind of provide any kind of information at the end. Uh, anybody that wants to you know, know more about the program, learn more about program, feel free to go to our website, email, call, I'm available, Jim and Liz are available. Uh, we're right at that, you know, 44 minutes in, so we did great, thank you. you. You two have been phenomenal, Liz, with your time and Jim, just with your insights. And uh, you know, look forward to a growing second class and, uh, 
you know, thank you uh, for, I think we have 36, you know, registrations. I think at one point I counted 17 to 20 people actively listening in. This will be recorded. So everybody who registered will get a link to watch this at, at, um, you know, at a later time. And we did a, a, a more overview webinar last year. So anybody that wants more of a general overview of the program can watch that one. And this one is much more focused on the candidates, their experience in the first year, the brain trust faculty, more of a deeper dive into the inaugural classes experience. So thank you. Uh, with that said, uh, thanks again, Liz and Jim. Thank and you, Jane. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.